of your love We're forgiven Because of your love Our hearts are clean And we lift you up With songs of freedom Forever we're changed Because of your love
and welcome to some time in the Word with Richmond Hill Community Church. People of Richmond Hill, we are back in Neighborhood Church for another season, and I'm so excited to be here with you today. Meals have always held a special place in Scripture, serving as moments for connection, teaching, and transformation. Throughout the Gospels, we see that some of Jesus' most profound interactions happened around a table. From surprising guests to miraculous feasts, each meal was more than just food. It was an invitation into His love, grace, and into His kingdom values. So over the next four weeks, including today, as we share dinner with Jesus, we'll gather around some of these stories and witness how Jesus welcomed people from all walks of life to join him. Each message will highlight an encounter where Jesus used the setting of a meal to challenge, forgive, and transform. Through these stories, we will quickly see that Jesus' invitation is open to each of us to bring our struggles, our questions, and our hopes to the table. Together, we're going to explore how these dinners reveal the heart of Jesus and invite us to live as people transformed by His grace. So, without further ado, let's begin. I want you to imagine that you are at a dinner in the house of a well-known and respected person in town. The air is filled with the scent of food and the hum of conversation, and also perhaps a bit of tension is in the air because this isn't any ordinary meal. Jesus is there, sitting amongst religious leaders, people who know the law, who know the right way to live. And as the evening unfolds, in walks a woman, one with a reputation that precedes her. All eyes are on her, and the whispers start. Now, this just isn't any woman. The townspeople, they know her story. And yet, here she is at this gathering. She doesn't sit back waiting for a signal that she's welcome, but rather instead, she goes straight to Jesus. She kneels and she begins to weep at his feet, pouring expensive perfume over them and washing them with her tears. It's shockingly uncomfortable, even scandalous. And what happens next is a lesson in grace and forgiveness that shows us the very heart of Jesus. To find out what, I'd invite you to turn in your Bibles to Luke 7, verses 36 to 50. Pause the video here, and whether you are on your own or whether you are gathered in a neighborhood church today, go and experience the Word of God, and we will be right back. All right, we're back. I want you to imagine again for a moment what it took for this woman to enter that room. She knew the judgment that awaited her. People would stare, they would gossip, they would criticize, but her love for Jesus overpowered 
her fear. Her actions were a display of deep repentance, a heart willing to give up everything for the one that she saw as worthy. This was more than an act of desperation. It was an act of love. And through this act, she was saying, I'm not going back to my old life. I'm giving you, you Jesus, I'm giving you everything. The great Henry Nouwen once wrote, when we come to God, we cannot remain the same. This woman's actions embodied this truth. She came to Jesus in vulnerability, bringing her past sins and her past burdens. And in that moment, she showed us that true repentance, rather, is not about shame. It's about transformation. Richard Foster reminds us that repentance is not something God demands of us that he could forego if he wished. It is simply a description of the way to come home. As you think about your own life today, what holds you back from coming to Jesus with that same kind of vulnerability? Are there things in your life that you haven't let go of? Things you're afraid to bring before him? I just want to remind you that true repentance is about bringing everything to Jesus and trusting that his love will cover it all. Then there's Simon, the Pharisee. He watches all of this with skepticism, and perhaps even a bit of scorn. In his mind, he's already judged her. Simon's heart is set on appearances, on keeping sinners like her at arm's length. And Jesus, he knows exactly what Simon is thinking. He turns to him, And he tells a story about two debtors, one who owed much and one who owed little. Both debts were forgiven, but who, but who would love the forgiver more? In verse 43, Simon answers, I suppose the one whom he canceled the larger debt for. In his book, The Cost of Discipleship, Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes this, Judging others makes us blind, whereas love is illuminating. Simon's judgment, you see, blinded him to this woman's love, her sacrifice, and her repentance. But Jesus, Jesus sees her heart. He shifts Simon's perspective, showing him that it's not about who has the least amount of sin, but about who is willing to come to Jesus, warts and all, and find grace. So here's a tough question that I've had to consider for my own self this week. Who do I resemble more in this story? Simon or Jesus? Am I quick to judge others by their past or by their choices? Or am I able to look beyond that, even beneath that, seeing the potential for grace and transformation in each person? Jesus calls us as his followers to extend grace, 
to see beyond the labels and judgment that society may impose, and to love as he loves. That is the way of Jesus. Finally, in verses 48 and 50, Jesus turns his attention to the woman and says, Your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. You see, in speaking these words over her, Jesus didn't just pardon her past. He gave her a new beginning, a new identity. She walked into that room as a woman defined by her past mistakes, but she walked out as someone forgiven, redeemed, and beloved. In that moment, Jesus not only forgave, he restored her dignity. Brennan Manning, in his book, The Ragamuffin Gospel, I love that title, he writes this, Define yourself radically as one beloved by God. This is the true self. Every other identity is an illusion. Jesus doesn't let this woman leave with society's labels. He sends her off with a new identity, grounded in his love and in his grace. You know, as we witness this story unfold this morning, some questions beg to be answered. Questions like this. How often do we carry around our past mistakes, letting them define us? Through the answer to this question, we find that Jesus offers us a new identity. He tells us that our worth isn't determined by what we've done, but by who we are in Him. Are there labels? Are there burdens that you're holding on to that Jesus is calling you to release? These are such important questions to ask and realities to pay attention to in our lives today. So as we, again, consider this story from the Gospel of Luke today, allow me to suggest to you some invitations that may be present here for you and I. The first one is, it's the invitation to embrace the vulnerability of repentance. Just like the woman who came to Jesus, we are invited to bring everything, our mistakes, our pain, our regrets to Jesus. Not an easy thing, but he asks us to do it. So perhaps you want to find some time or take some time this week to reflect on the areas where you just need to simply let go, or perhaps even the language is just let it be and turn towards God. In prayer or by journaling, maybe lay those things down before him, asking for his forgiveness and asking for the power of his spirit to change you. The second invitation I see here is to choose grace over judgment. I want you to take some time, perhaps, to think about the people in your life or in your community who might feel judged or marginalized. How might you offer grace to that person today? Acceptance and love instead of judgment. Perhaps I can challenge you to look for ways to intentionally reach out, whether it's through a conversation or an act of kindness or just simply a word of encouragement sometimes can be powerful stuff in that case. Number three, 
a third invitation to live out your new identity. Jesus offers us, offers everyone, the opportunity to have a new identity as his beloved. And that changes everything. So I'd invite you to spend some time uh, perhaps just writing down a list of what it means to be loved by Jesus to you. Perhaps words like forgiven, accepted, valued, free are words that might come to mind. And then I want you to place that list somewhere that you'll see it daily. Maybe it's on your bedside table on the kind of on the side as you wake up is the first thing you see. Maybe it's on um, the mirror in your bathroom where you go perhaps for the first thing in the morning. Wherever you choose, it doesn't matter. But let it be a reminder to you that in Christ you are not defined by your past, but you are defined by your identity with him, by his grace in your life. So as we close our time in the Word today, um, I think we've seen through this lesson at Simon's Table that Jesus showed that his table is a place for sinners and saints alike. People who think they've got it figured out, and perhaps people who um, know they haven't. He invited this woman, judged and broken into a place of honor and forgiveness. Jesus offers that same thing to us. No matter what our past is, no matter what our mistakes are, he offers us a seat at his table. And as we take some time today to reflect a little bit further in our neighborhood church, or perhaps on your own if that's where you're at at the moment, Let's remember that his table was always open. And he's inviting us not just to dine with him, but to live in the freedom, rather, of his grace and his love that he offers. And he invites us to bring others to that table, too. Living out this love and this grace in every part of our life. Won't you join me as we pray together in these moments? Heavenly Father, we are in awe of your grace and of your mercy and how you look beyond our flaws, our shortcomings, to see our heart. Thank you, God, for welcoming us to your table where we can come as we are, broken, vulnerable, and in need of your love. Help us to embrace, Lord, the gift of repentance, to let go of the past and to lean into the new identity you have given us as your beloved children. Teach us to be vessels of your grace. Just as you offered compassion to the woman at Simon's house, help us to extend love and acceptance to those around us. Let our lives reflect your heart so that others may feel welcomed, forgiven, and transformed in your presence. And God, as we leave this place in just a little while, May we carry your love to all we meet and live as people of your open table. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray these things. Amen.
strong.